This episode of Can We Please Talk podcast is presented by our friends over at SeatGeek. Do not hit skip right now because your next best night ever is waiting and SeatGeek has the tickets, shows, uh, music events, uh, sporting events, whatever you want to go to, go to SeatGeek.com right now. SeatGeek.com right now. Enter in the promo code Can We Please Talk to get $20 off that purchase. Head to SeatGeek.com today. Hey, everybody. Welcome into an all-new episode of the Can We Please Talk podcast. As always, I'm Mike Leon, but my co-host is in the most magical place on earth. Depending upon what age group you're in, you may agree or disagree with that statement. So joining me, as always, to help fill in the blank here is my co-host, Fox News contributor, former State Department spokesperson, Marie Harf. Marie, good to see you. I'm so happy to be back. You know, some people, I guess, get to take vacations. I don't know. There's a lot going on this week, though. So. I know. What, <laughs> Nick Nick is always going away during debates, Super Tuesday. He, he's not lining up properly for a news commentary show. I'll, I'll let him know that you said that. On the program today, Super Tuesday is almost here in America. 19 states, Democrat and Republican primaries. We'll probably find out if Nikki Haley stays in this race past Tuesday. Marie and I are going to break it all down, give you some things to pay attention to across the different states as you watch the results unfold. Plus, later on in the program, we're going to discuss the latest on the war in Gaza between Israel and Hamas. We're going to deep dive on this war at large and how this is playing out for the Biden administration. More on that in our next segment. Uh, an all-new episode, before I say hello to you, Marie, and, and dive a little bit further in our first segment, an all-new episode of the Ask the Experts podcast is out there. This week, Kern Batia was live at the Devin Haney and Ryan Garcia press conference, interviews with Oscar De La Hoya, interviews with Bernard Hopkins, all the latest news and notes coming out of that fight happening April 20th in Las Vegas. Kern's got you covered. Check out an all-new episode of Ask the Experts over on LeonMediaNetwork.com or listen to it wherever you get your podcast. Great show. I'm so excited for Kern. That was some big interviews that he had lined up there on the program. So happy for him. Now, before I say hello to you, one more thing. Well, two quick things, actually. Uh, one that caught my eye and a former colleague of mine uh, recently passed away. Chris Mortensen, the legendary ESPN NFL insider, died at the age of 72. For those of you that follow sports and, and watch ESPN, you would know who he is, as Chris always had the inside track to all of the owners around the NFL and he recently passed away uh, this past, well, Sunday as we're recording this. I happened to work at ESPN for a couple of years and got to know more a little bit. And super nice to me. You know, I was a young kid, 27, 28 years old, Adam Schefter, Chris Mortensen, a lot of these guys that I idolize and I watched on TV. I hope the segment's around. So uh, I feel for more and his family. Uh, and so shout out to all of them. And then one other thing I just wanted everyone to pay attention to here, uh, as I was on my bike ride today, and I wanted to mention at the top of the show, I saw a video that The Rock recently put out, Dwayne Johnson, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, who The Rock is, if you live under a rock, um, and he put out a video of uh, something that he recently did for the family of Lily Rose. Um, if you don't know this story, I want you to go check out the Lily Rose Foundation, because Lily was, uh, I believe, eight-year-old uh, girl who passed away with cancer. And her parents um, were very big fans of not only The Rock, but one of the things that the dad would always do is sing Moana songs to her when she was getting treatment. And um, it, it, it moved me a lot because obviously I have two young girls, Maria, as you know. And um, watching this and what The Rock did, they started a foundation in her honor and The Rock gave $50,000 to that foundation and charity. Um, it's very moving. You can kind of hear it a little bit in my voice right now, so I don't want to get too emotional. But if you want to go check out that video, go to The Rock's uh, TikTok, Instagram, go check out the Live for Lily Rose Foundation, Conquering Childhood Cancer, One Smile at a Time. Um, it's, it's truly heartbreaking stuff, what's happening. And I, I wanted to bring that up at the top of the show because I happened to see it on my bike ride. And I, I shout out to The Rock for doing that and the folks that set that up. Uh, and a chance meeting. And it was so it was very cool to see. So go check it out. All right. Now I say hello. I mean, I don't know how we transitioned, Marie, but now I say hello to you. How are you doing? How's everything? I saw you earlier on Fox News Sunday for people that don't watch with uh, our buddy Shannon Bream. Did a great job yeah. as always. How's everything going your way? Thank you. Um, you know, it's a crazy time. We are 
fully in election mode now, right? Like we are getting new polls every day. Super Tuesday's coming up, the State of the Union. I just started a new job actually at the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm commuting between DC and Philly and, you know, life is busy. Life is busy. That's that's how I would describe it right now. And I'm always happy to be here with you to break yeah, it Well, up I in. appreciate that. Thank you. You know, you know, you're <laughs> one of our favorites and, and I don't know how the fans feel about you because I haven't polled them, but I would think that you're one of their <laughs> favorites. And if they're not, who cares? Because we love you. Oh, um, I hope so. Yeah. So um, I forgot that you were commuting too to the new job. That is true. I, at the University of Pennsylvania is is uh, yeah. happy to have you. Let's speak of, by the way, a UPenn grad, Miss Miss Harf, in the former president Donald John Trump. What a transition, Mike! Oh, I what a it. transition! God, I, that was good. That I was find good. them. I find them. <laughs> that's how you do it. So. Let's learn a little bit more about what's been happening over the last couple of days. We were mentioning about it as we get into Super Tuesday. But this past weekend, there was a bunch of primaries and a caucus that you may not even know what happened. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, the former president winning in Idaho and Missouri. Take a listen to this. Two News projects that Donald Trump won the Republican caucus in a landslide, taking home 32 of the state's delegates. Of course, it follows a string of wins for the Republican frontrunner today. NBC News also projects that Trump won Missouri's GOP caucus, taking home 54 of that state's delegates and the rest of Michigan's delegates, 39 in all, were also awarded to Trump today amid a complicated and chaotic convention process. Complicated is an understatement for what happened in Michigan. We'll get into that in a second. I want to get Marie, I want to get some of your thoughts on, on all of that. But like you just heard there, Idaho, Missouri, uh, he won the Nevada uh, caucus, which obviously Nikki Haley had opted for the primary in that she lost to none of these candidates. He won in New Hampshire. He's won in South Carolina. Um, so far on a high level, Marie, as we've been watching this unfold, and only one of us here on this panel has been a campaign manager uh, for somebody. So give me a little bit of your takeaways of as we head into Super Tuesday, what do, what do you make so far of what GOP primary voters are saying about Donald John Trump being their their candidate nominee? Well, he's going to be the nominee. Uh, the way the Republicans have set their primaries up, winner take all in most states. Certainly that's true on Super Tuesday. He is winning all of these primaries. But there are, depending on the state, dozens, you know, 40% in, in, in at least one state of Republican primary voters who are choosing someone else in Nikki Haley. Joe Biden is winning a bigger percentage of the Democratic primary voters than Donald Trump is winning of the Republican primary voters. And we see some interesting data in the people voting for Nikki Haley. There's a percentage of them who say they won't vote for Donald Trump. Nikki Haley outraised Donald Trump last month. She raised more money than he did. So Donald Trump is in control of the party. He is going to win the primary absent some catastrophic I don't know, situation that I can't really fathom right now. But a lot of Republicans are saying uh, they want someone else and they want Nikki Haley. And so Donald Trump isn't doing anything yet to bring the Haley voters in. He's certainly not trying to get Biden voters. We see this in poll after poll. Donald Trump has a really hard feeling. His supporters are excited, but he doesn't get a lot of people outside of his supporters. And so in the Republican primary, you know, that those are the takeaways so far. He is cruising to victory, but there are a lot of Republican voters who want someone else. And I don't think they will all vote for Donald Trump. That's what I'm taking away from it so far. You know, that's really well said, because I was thinking about that earlier today. I've been asked about it. And I, I made a joke to S.C. Cup, who I think uh, we both know mutually. And she was talking about the party hasn't coalesced around Trump. And I was like, it doesn't have to. This is a math problem right now. He doesn't he doesn't need them yet. Like he's getting his people to turn out. And this is what GOP primary voters are saying right now. They don't care about Nikki Haley. Now, I will be interested to see what happens, obviously, as we get closer to November, if those same folks are going to say, you know what, are no matter who, or I'm going to sit this out, or like in 2020, you had a bunch that crossed over and voted for Joe Biden. So it will be interesting to see what happens. But right now, Donald Trump has 244 delegates. Nikki Haley has 43, the magic number. 1,215. All right, let's let's flip over to the Democratic side because there really isn't much going on the Democratic side, but we're going to mention it because Joe Biden had something interesting happen in Michigan. We're going to get to that in a second. But so far, 
He's cruised through in New Hampshire. He wasn't it wasn't even the first uh, primary for the Democratic side, but he won that in a landslide. He won in South Carolina. He's won in Michigan. But the biggest storyline and takeaway that's been coming out of Michigan is this uncommitted vote on the Democratic side that got about 13 percent uh, in terms of over 100,000 folks voting uncommitted. And I'm going to give you a number in a second uh, during Barack Obama's uh, reelection campaign back in 2012, how that number was kind of similar. But first, before we get into the reason for the uncommitted vote, what did you make so far on the Democratic side as, you know, Dean Phillips is still hanging around. Marianne Williamson somehow unsuspended her campaign after suspending <laughs> it because she got to like the smallest number ever. I was like, what? I couldn't I didn't even know you could do that. I mean, that's why you suspend them. Somebody told me somebody from the Libertarian Party. Um, what do you make so far of what Biden has done? Because there's and again. We're going to get Super Tuesday, so we're going to get a lot more states involved on the Democratic side. We don't expect anything crazy to happen. What are you seeing so far? What are you hearing so far? Yeah, I mean, I think that Joe Biden is picking up a huge share of the Democratic vote, um, 80 plus, 90 plus percent in places. So the Democratic Party, who is voting, I think by and large, and we can talk about Michigan, uh, understands that he will be the nominee. I do think that there are a couple of things I'm watching. You know, we there's a bunch of new polling that's come out recently. The New York Times poll over the weekend. Uh, Fox News had a, a new poll Sunday morning that we debuted that actually had the race a little closer. So I think for, as far as the primary goes, Biden's fine. He's cruising to victory here. But I do think there are some warning signs in the polling and in some of these places that I hope the campaign is taking seriously. The coalition that elected Joe Biden in 2020 has not fully come back together. Um, you know, Donald Trump isn't getting Joe Biden's disaffected voters, so they're not going to Trump, but they're not showing up for Biden yet. You know, in Michigan, Joe Biden, um, I think it was in Michigan, won a higher percentage of the party's votes than Donald Trump did, but Republicans overall turned out a bunch more people, right? So I say that to say, um, Democrats have to get the coalition turned out. They have to get them excited. They have to get them voting for Joe Biden again. And so if you look at some of these states, I think some of the low turnout numbers, look, it's an incumbent, so there's not a real primary, but they have to be paying attention here because this is a close election. The consequences of losing it, as you know, are pretty extraordinary. Again, I, I agree with everything. I mean, there's not there's not there's not much to analyze, though, like you said, on the Democratic side. I mean, the, the biggest storyline and I want to get into it in a second is this uncommitted vote. As a matter of fact, before we even get into uh, level setting the table on Super Tuesday, let's talk a little bit about this uncommitted vote. The stat I wanted to give you, Marie, which was and our the folks watching on YouTube can kind of see this stat. And it was up on CNN. It was the uncommitted vote in Michigan primaries uh, with an incumbent Democratic president on the ballot. Back in 2012, 11% uncommitted votes on the Democratic side of the aisle. In 2024, here in Michigan, it was 13%. So only two percentage points. And we know why the uncommitted vote is voting uncommitted because of what's happening out in the Middle East and the war in Gaza and over 30,000 Palestinians that have lost their lives. Obviously, we can't forget about the events that happened on October 7th. Um, we've heard a lot and, and and the media has made a lot about hate even saying the media. It's like been cannibalized as like this weapon term. I, I know. Mean, and, and now you and I are a part of it. So I, I get yelled at, too, just as much as you get yelled at. Um, the, but the media has been covering what's been happening in Dearborn, Michigan. There's a large population of a Arab Americans there, Muslim Americans uh, and some Palestinian Americans, including the mayor, I believe, uh, of the city. And it, it, a lot of these folks turned out. You saw some surrogates. I saw Nina Turner, who used to be a Bernie Sanders' campaign manager or worked for the campaign. Um, she was mentioning on CNN why this coalition of uncommitted. It's almost like a, 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 a salvo to President Biden to say, listen to the folks right now, because you need to stop this right now. You need to have a ceasefire. What did you make of this uncommitted vote and the message behind it and why it's happening? We're going to get into it in a sec. Well, I think they were trying to send a message and trying to prompt the Biden administration to change their policy. And look, the Joe Biden deeply believes in the relationship with Israel. You can feel it in his bones, right? We've talked about this, but you've seen him and his and his administration increasingly doing things, you know, just airdrop some aid to the Palestinians over the weekend. Like, I think they understand setting aside electoral politics for a second. They understand this is a moral, diplomatic, whatever problem across the board. 
So I think that the uncommitted voters, I don't know if you agree with this, but we're trying to send a message, trying to get the Biden team to change. I think a large portion of them will come back to the Democratic Party before Election Day when faced with a Donald Trump presidency. I have to believe they will. But we can't take it for granted. And one, I just want to give you one statistic. You know, we talk a lot about Arab American voters in Michigan. We talk a lot about these progressives in Michigan. Joe Biden won Michigan by about 154,000 votes in 2020. Okay. So we've talked a lot about this one group of voters, but do you know how many Polish, Finnish, or Baltic voters live in Michigan? So the countries that Russia would invade next if Donald Trump lets them do so, like he said, about 900,000. I only bring up that statistic to say, we talk a lot about uh, you know, group politics and who's voting for who and who can be turned out and how Israel, Palestine is playing into this. I want the Biden campaign to go to Michigan and run ads with Donald Trump telling Russia to invade those countries every day between now and November, right? If we're worried about Michigan, we need to do a little bit differently on our Palestine-Israel policy, but also talk about this, right? So I think electorates are made up of a lot of different people, and we shouldn't focus too much on one or on this uncommitted vote, because I think it's a little more complicated. And I think there are lots of ways to get the votes we need uh, in November. Spoken like a true campaign, former campaign manager. See, right there. No, this is what we need to do. Run this ad here. I mean, I I agree. I didn't even know that number. By the way, that's a very good and telling number. I will tell you, though, and speaking with some of the folks I've spoken to, you know, that are Muslim, um, the mm -hmm. Arab American as well. You know, it depends on who you talk to. But like you said, right now, if there was an election happening right now between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, I think a lot of those folks that I know would sit out personally as Agreed. almost a protest vote. Uh, like you said, I don't think they're going to Donald Trump, but I don't think they're voting for Joe Biden. So in essence, would not help um, either party and would actually ultimately hurt Donald Trump. I do want to um, ask you now, Marie, let's pivot to what we expect for Super Tuesday. Uh, for those of you watching, let me tease, watch CNN throughout the day as I will be on TV covering Super Tuesday after the results come in. So you can check that out and check your local listings or watch it on Max. Now, transitioning, how, what do you expect for Super Tuesday? There's 19 states that are going to be participating now in this vote. Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, about seven or eight of them are, are open primaries, Alabama, Colorado, Arkansas, Maine, Virginia, Texas, Tennessee is partially open, which means obviously for people that don't know that you can either be an independent or you can be uh, not registered with both parties, but you could also you could be registered with either party, excuse me, and still participate in the others. Mm -hmm. As you got to check the process that the state goes through. It's different processes. So wherever you live, wherever you're listening to this, please go check. Some do same day registration where you can go and vote. So if you do want to make your voice heard, go out there and vote on Super Tuesday if you live in one of those states. But what is what is something that you're closely paying attention to, even though we just mentioned right now, there's not much to pay attention to. GOP primary voters are saying Donald Trump's their guy. Joe Biden has no challenger, no realistic challenger. So what is something that people should pay attention to across these states come this Tuesday? Uh, well, I'll also give a plug to watch Fox News, even though I won't be on on Tuesday. So, okay. you know, we can we can we can give our plugs here to, to watch the different channels that we're on. Um, you should get lots of sources of news, as you and I, I have talked about. I um, so, I mean, look, the, the results are not really in doubt. I think there's three things I'm watching. Number one is the margin of victory that Trump has. And again, that won't impact delegate counts because the Republicans have set this up to be winner take all. Uh, in some states, changing that to help Donald Trump after the last election. Um, but if Nikki Haley is getting 20, 30, 40 percent in some of these places, that's a real warning sign for the Trump campaign. And it probably means she's continuing to raise money and probably means she's staying in the race. And Democrats will tell you Nikki Haley is doing the best anti-Trump ads of anyone right now. Right. It's like she's giving us free uh anti-Trump ads right now. So the longer she stays in, I think the better for, for Joe Biden. So that the margin of victory is number one. Um, number two is uh, 
you know, it's not just the presidential primary we have to watch. Obviously, there's a big Senate primary in California. There are um, there are a number of other races. Not all of them are actually on this Super Tuesday, but in some of these states to see what the electorate looks like. There, there's some Senate races that we should be watching as well. And third is uh, is how Joe, you know, how Joe Biden does. And if he maintains sort of this put above 80 percent, 90 percent, if he's really cruising, I have to believe that the Dean Phillips of the world, he's apparently still in the race. These people kind of drop out and their Democratic primary is really set. The thing we haven't talked about and they're not in these primaries is these third party candidates, right? RFK Jr. I mean, some of the polling on these guys has them polling pretty high. So I think that's not Super Tuesday doesn't really impact that. But um, you know, I, it's not going to be a normal Super Tuesday where the, the outcome is in doubt. So I don't know what else you're watching. Those are just some of the things I'm watching come come Tuesday. Well, you just fed into something I forgot to tell you before we started recording, Marie, as now the director of policy and strategy over at freeandequal.org. You can go check us out at freeandequal.org. I've been working with uh, putting on debates, and we just had a third party debate this past week. Jill Stein participated in it. Chase Oliver, if you don't know that name from the Libertarian Party, he was actually the reason there was a runoff in Georgia in the Senate races. He got 2% back in 2020. So these are some of the candidates that are running for it. RFK and Cornell West were invited to that debate. So you're right. Once we get to September, October, and into November, mm-hmm. we're going to really try to see what those third-party candidates are going to do. My my focus really is the open primary states because, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's polling around the college-educated vote being more f- favored towards Haley as opposed to Trump. And in some of those states, you know, like uh, Colorado, like, a, you know, well, not really a Maine, but Colorado and Virginia, I think are the Virginia. two Yeah, I think yeah. those are the two states that I would be watching that – if Haley can win one or two of these states, I think she stays in it until there's, you know, until the convention, to be honest with you. I mean, even though most of the other ones are winner take all, like you said. So I, I don't know what her path to victory is. As I look at some of these states, I mean, I mean, come on, is she going to win Alabama, Arkansas, Texas, Tennessee? There's no chance. No, right? no. So she doesn't have a path to victory. Right. But as long as she has money. Right. She can stay in this race. And I think she's staying in as long as possible to be the I told you so candidate. When Trump goes to jail or loses to Biden in four years, she's like, that could have had me. And that's what I think she's doing. But you're, it's Virginia is an interesting question. I live at, currently live in Virginia, um, although I'll be living in Pennsylvania soon, another swing state. Um, but like the Glenn Youngkin, she's much more a Glenn Youngkin type Republican. Right. Than Donald Trump. Right. I will be interested to watch uh, all of those states and how they play out. I did want to mention to you, because you just kind of said it there about Haley is giving us some sound on on the former president, some things we can use in an ad. All right. Before we go to the break, I do want to ask you now, these two are going to be, you know, the presumptive nominees for the respective parties. It's now Trump versus Biden. We talked about a little bit about voters that are voting for Haley right now may not vote. How does Donald Trump get some of these folks to vote for him when he's not giving messages, when he's actually doing things that sound like this? The votes came in, then they added a lot of votes to it. You you saw it. It was a rigged, totally rigged election. They know it, too. The only thing they don't want, they don't want people talking about that election. Even Fox. Fox is afraid to talk about it. They're all afraid to talk about it. Maria, I feel like this is a rap battle, and you have to (laughs) respond to him saying Fox doesn't. But wait, before you respond to that... um, He's giving mess. This was that what happened this past weekend in Virginia. So that was literally 48 hours ago, depending upon when you're listening to this. His message has not changed. And we're seeing that potentially some of these Haley voters won't be voting for him if, you know, if there was an election happening tomorrow. Fortunately for him, I can't believe I'm saying that it doesn't happen until November. So what do you think happens as we get to November? A, for Joe Biden, message wise. What does he need to do? Does he need to get out in front of the camera? Does he need to be everywhere? Does he need to go into hiding, using air quotes here, like he did in the lead up to 2020, where people, it was a very mysterious thing. We didn't know too much about Joe Biden. He wasn't saying too much. And all of a sudden, people went out there and voted for him because of this. And then on the flip side, do you think Trump ever has a chance with any of these Haley type of voters if they truly truly on november say i'm not voting for this guy i can't do it just listen to that he's still living in the past do you think there's a chance that these folks come around and do end up voting for him 
uh, Donald Trump is not doing anything to get these voters. He's just not. And I think some of them will come home to the Republican Party because they just can't fathom not voting for a Republican. But I think a bunch of them won't. And I think a lot of the suburban women, the independent women, you know, I think the Democrats are and Joe Biden, you know, he's going to have a much more aggressive campaign. He'll get out there more. The vice president will get out there more. Barack Obama will get out there more. And on these issues, right, women's health and freedom, a lot of those Nikki Haley voters care about that. IVF, we're talking about IVF now, right? Like, and and so that's just picking one issue out of a hat, but there are a lot. And Donald Trump has shown himself incapable of trying to win back Nikki Haley voters or even independents. I mean, the latest Fox News poll this weekend, Biden's still winning independence by eight. And that's, a you know, and I... Biden has a lot of room to grow there. So I, I think that Donald Trump does not care about getting them. I think he doesn't think he needs to. And I think it's a real opportunity for Joe Biden here. All right. Well, we leave it there because, again, only one of us on this panel has run a successful campaign and gotten somebody elected. It's not me. So when we come back <laughs> after the break, I do want to lean on Marie's expertise as having worked for the State Department and actually being at the podium and taking tough questions from journalists because I'm going to play some sound for you on the other side of an interaction with Matthew Miller and a journalist from Al Jazeera. I want you to react to that. We're going to talk about everything happening in Gaza with the latest on the Israel Hamas war. Excuse me, the Israel Hamas war when we come back after the break. Nick, today's episode is presented as always by our friends over at Fresh Roasted Coffee. Since 2009, their passion has always been bringing you gourmet coffees from all over the world, roasted fresh to order. I got my coffee snob here, Nick Saveri. Nick, tell these people, coffee snob it up here. Tell these people why fresh roasted coffee is so good and why they're the official sponsor of Can We Please Talk? You know, often the best cup of coffee that you're ever going to have is the one you can, you can make from home. And you need good quality coffee to do that. And that's what fresh roasted coffee offers. You know, between single origin, between blends, flavors, anything on the coffee spectrum they've got. But more importantly, and I can't stress this enough, often when you purchase coffee, you don't know where to start. I mean, there's so many different varieties, so many different opportunities, so many different things you could choose from. And Fresh Roast of Coffee just gives you a very simple questionnaire and just says, hey, figure out what your cup, what your coffee cup is. Figure out what blend works for you. I've gotten some single origin recommendations, so is Mike, and that's influenced everything. And what they recommend, you can get in a Keurig cup, the way Mike takes it. You can take it in the way I do it, which is typically through a French press, or you can get it for a percolator. Whatever coffee machine you've got, they've got you covered. But more importantly, just a huge variety and a way to learn more about coffee itself. And all of this is available at freshroastedcoffee.com on their site. One cup is all it takes to fall in love with fresh roasted coffee, but you get a discount for being a listener of Can We Please Talk. Enter in the promo code Can We Please Get 20 to get 20% off your first purchase. Head to freshroastedcoffee.com today. Nick, quick break from the pod because this episode is presented by our friends over at SeatGeek. Your next best night ever is waiting, my friend, and they've got the tickets. You want to go to an NBA game, an NFL game, a concert, Major League Baseball, whatever it is, all you got to do is go to SeatGeek.com. You're going to enter in the promo code, Can We Please Talk, and you're going to get $20 off that purchase right now at SeatGeek. Nick, what are you going to do with your $20 off on those tickets, buddy? I mean, that saves me on anything. I can get food at the game. I can just get the tickets themselves. I mean, baseball's coming along, so I'm excited for that. I can get upper deck tickets and just nothing. And then just all I got to do is worry about food. I mean, anywhere I want to use this, uh, it's well worth it. 20 bucks is, is a worthwhile investment. That's right. And I've seen you at sporting events. You eat a lot. Nick needs those $20 off. So go to SeatGeek.com right now. Enter in the promo code, Can We Please Talk? You're going to get $20 off that purchase. All right. The latest on the war that's happening in Gaza between Israel and Hamas, I wanted to lean on on you, uh, Marie, because obviously you worked at the State Department once upon a time. And there's been a lot of stuff that's been happening with the latest on the war. We talked a little bit about it with the uncommitted vote in Michigan right now. But 
the war itself and what has happened on October 7th, the horrific attacks by Hamas, obviously, and the 1,200 or so Israelis that have been killed. There's still about 150 hostages, I believe, as of this recording that are still out there that have not been you know, part of any hostage negotiations. We're still trying to figure out what is happening with that. The Biden administration has mentioned that they were hoping for some type of peace talks and some type of hostage negotiation over uh, we expected right now, if you're listening to us on a Monday, it was expected by this Monday. We don't think that that's going to happen now. Um, first, before we dive into a couple of different things that people have said, media outlet wise, from a, a very prominent Jewish host of a television show, in addition to uh, uh, one of your who's now replaced you uh, for years later and Matthew Miller, a spokesperson for the State Department, something he said. But I just want at a 30,000 overview for you. As you're watching this unfold, and now we're, uh, you know, my math sucks. What are we, five, six months into this? And we're seeing countless loss of life on the Palestinian side, people that had nothing to do with this conflict or even voted for Hamas, including the kids that have been killed in this. Um, and then obviously the families of these hostages that have not been returned, they're waiting days, days, months, weeks uh, for these folks. And there's nothing in sight with Bibi Netanyahu you know, blowing up Gaza to smithereens. And in the process, he's even killed some of the hostages here. What, what do you make of what's been happening and playing out in the war from a 30,000 foot overview? Well, I mean, it's it's a tragedy on every level, starting on October 7th and the terrorist attack by Hamas. I think that Prime Minister Netanyahu has no idea what he's doing. And I say that not flippantly. I think he... Um, has no strategy for actually, quote, defeating Hamas, which I don't even know how you actually, quote, defeat Hamas. You can prevent them from attacking you. You can neutralize the threat. All of that, I understand that. But getting to a place where Hamas is not threatening Israel and what you do with all of the Palestinians, right? I mean, there is a longer-term question here. Prime Minister Netanyahu has made it very clear that he has no interest in a two-state solution. So then what happens to millions of Palestinians who are not Hamas, right? We have to say that over and over and over and over again. And there are so many things he has done during his time as prime minister that has weakened Israel, made Israel less safe, made Israel less democratic, that I don't think he is the, he is, you know, Tom Friedman on the Ezra Klein podcast a couple of weeks ago said that Prime Minister Netanyahu was the worst Jewish leader in history. I don't know if I'd go quite that far. It's a long history, but certainly um, the worst Israeli leader. And I think that the families who are pressing him to do more to get the hostages home, the United States who is pressing him to be more careful and targeted in his attacks in Gaza, the United States who's pressing him to pressure the settlers in the West Bank who are killing Palestinians. Um, he has no plan to maintain Israel as a Jewish democracy in the Middle East. And he's doing things every day to undermine its security and its character as such. And so I think I, 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 am, I am very pessimistic about what's happening now. Uh, the Biden team is very engaged in the hostage negotiations. They're trying to get these folks home. And I think they will continue pressing uh, Israel, um, even though on the Palestinian side, there is not a, a partner. We don't know who will lead the Palestinians at the end of this um, for some for some some answer to this 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 question at the end of the day. But I'm I'm in a pretty pessimistic place right now, candidly. Yeah. I feel the same way, Marie. Um, you know, I did want to ask you, it's 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 apropos that we've had you that we have you on for this episode because as as we were texting back and forth about talking about this, as some things started to run through my head. And I, I would love for you to say yes or no, or even you know, uh, talk a little bit more about it because again, you worked for uh, as an advisor to a former Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry. Obviously, Anthony Blinken is having that job right now, and he's got to go out there and has at least gone out a couple of times to Israel and met with Bibi Netanyahu. Um, first, have you, have you gone, have you ever met Bibi Netanyahu? And then um, you're shaking your head. So, but, so when the secretary of state and the prime minister are meeting, give our audience a little bit of background of like what those talks are about as somebody having, you know, set up these talks and been in those rooms to kind of hear what the conversation is, is going through. What do you think Blinken's team is saying? Because 
there's a lot of folks that are in the media, obviously uh, Muslim, Arab Americans. Mehdi, Mehdi Hassan comes to mind, a friend of the show here who has said the Biden administration has levers at their disposal. They control the funding. Israeli officials have said without Papa U.S. and giving some weapons, we can't do most of this work. So we're giving the weapons. Why wouldn't the Biden administration or at least when the secretary of state goes out there, why wouldn't they say, look, you're not getting this. Stop right now. Let's come to the table and you're not getting this. Is it that simple as people are making it out in the media as somebody who has been involved in some of these conversations, maybe to a different extent? Are, are we oversimplifying it, Murray? Well, it's definitely not simple. And, you know, when I worked for Secretary Kerry, the first year in office, we spent a lot of time, Secretary Kerry did, getting the Middle East peace process restarted. So we, one, one of my first trips, my first trip with him actually, uh, spent a lot of time in Jordan, in Jerusalem, in Ramallah, shuttling back and forth. And we spent hours, days, weeks um, getting the peace process restarted. Um, we had the Israelis and the Palestinians to the State Department in D.C. to announce it. And it fell apart, as it always has. Um, there were, uh, again, as it always has, on, on both sides of this, broken promises and um no ability to build trust and move forward. Prime Minister Netanyahu was prime minister then, and it was exceedingly frustrating, I think, for Secretary Kerry, who is very pro-Israel, has worked with Bibi Netanyahu for a long time and other Israeli leaders, um, and to to feel like we were trying to help them and giving them, as you said, so much assistance, the most military assistance in history under the Obama administration, and we just, it, it was, it felt at times like he was just lying to us and not respecting us as a friend and partner. And I say that to say, it's not as simple today. Look, I think there are things we could do in terms of putting some controls on what the Israelis use the weapons we give them for. Um, for example, you can't use them in densely populated areas, right? There are some controls we can put on them. There are people who've argued for a wholesale, uh, rethinking of the relationship in terms of security assistance to Israel. Israel has a lot of its own uh, weapons now and has other partners it could get it from. But the bottom line is, Mike, that the Bi President Biden deeply believes in this relationship. And I, I cannot envision a scenario in which he would fundamentally alter the relationship with Israel. I think that Tony Blinken is trying to get Bibi and other Israelis to commit to protecting civilians, to letting these airdrops of food and water in, to letting some of these land corridors open up and get folks out. I think he's chipping away around the margins and trying to negotiate in somewhat tactical things, because I think that at the end of the day, those levers that you mentioned, which exist, will never be pulled by Joe Biden, I think. I, you know, it's tough for me to add on to that as somebody, again, never getting to the level of SME, as we like to say in the business world, the subject matter expert that you have in this and as having covered it. And there's just some of the things that came to my mind earlier today as I was preparing to talk to you because you have firsthand knowledge of meeting this, this leader. I love that you just said that about some of the things Secretary Kerry is very reserved, right? As, as you have mentioned to me before, he's a very, seems like I think a calm man. And uh, all of a sudden mm -hmm. he's feeling that certain way about the way BB has kind of viewed this relationship. And again, those that was 2014, I believe, if not mistaken. You tell me when that was, I believe it was. So, I mean, that's 10 years ago. And now here we are where we are. I did want to ask you, so now let's put back on, Marie's back at the podium at the State Department. <laughs> and obviously, because this war is being covered holistically, we've seen some of the UN resolutions that have been shot down. So many different outlets are covering this. Uh, and there's so many good reporters doing a lot of good work out there. And the biggest thing reporters are supposed to do, and now I'll be the journalist and put the journalist hat on, as you are the State Department spokesperson, is ask questions of why won't you do this? Why won't you do that? I want you to listen to this tense exchange that happened at the State Department between Matthew Miller and, and one of my colleagues. Well, I don't work at Al Jazeera, but I'll say a colleague because he's a journalist. Um, and I want you to listen to this exchange, and then we're going to react on the other side of not only how you would handle it, but the questions and the way Matt answered the question. So take a listen to this. Why is it so difficult for this government to say we condemn the killing of, of children, Palestinian women and children? Why can't you say the word? 
condemn. Uh, we do. We, I, I, Saeed, if you listened to what I said a moment ago, no, I, 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 hold on, hold I on, hold, Saeed, please don't interrupt me. Yeah. I said far too many right. Palestinians have yeah. died. Thousands right. of Palestinian children have died, and it is a, a, a tragedy when right. one of them dies. Of course, we don't want to see a single right. child die. Um, we don't want to see anyone die right. uh, as a result of this conflict, which is why we have been working to bring this conflict to a close as soon as possible. But uh, uh, whenever you ask me these questions, I do think you continue to kind of just elide over the fact that Hamas bears a great deal of responsibility for putting those children in harm's way. Remember, it was Hamas that launched this war in the first place with an attack on Israel that killed men, women, and children, and that Hamas that hid and continues to hide behind children as human shields. So okay. yes, we're, we're we do, okay. yes, we, we do not want to see right. any child yeah. die. We don't want to see any innocent civilian die, which is why we are working so hard to try to achieve a temporary ceasefire that would alleviate their suffering. Yeah. Yet I have not heard the word condemn. I mean, you know, this war began way before October 7. I mean, you know, in fact, the reason that uh, this administration was so strong on, you know, pursuing a Middle East peace and so on, because the war has been going on for, for decades before and so on. We heard this administration when they came into office talking about reopening the consulate, talking about reopening the, the, the PLO office here, talking about restarting and reigniting uh, peace talks and so on, re-aiding uh, UNRWA and so on, simply because that war has been going on for a very long time, because so Gaza was under siege. Look, before I ask you what I want to ask you, Marie, is it is very tough to be on camera, on TV. Uh, you may think you, you're going to say something and then you go out there and you say something completely different and you got to find your way through a sentence. I can't imagine what it's like, not only with cameras in a room of 50 people that you're staring at that are asking you questions that all have recording devices, that all have cameras pointed at you. And I'm sure you have your binder and you have your notes and you're ready and prepared, but it's incredibly hard and challenging. So you may say the wrong word that has the wrong connotation. And now the soundbite lives in infamy. So first and foremost for you, um, would you make of the exchange the way Matt kind of answered the question and, and take us through a little bit of the experience of being at that podium and answering those questions? It's got to be incredibly tough. I mean, if you search AP images of Marie Harf, there's a bunch of you on the podium and you're you're not too happy with some of the questions. So what did you make of, of the exchange and, and how it went, and how Matt ans answered the question and also how the journalists asked it about using yeah. the word condemn violence? Uh, well, this is fascinating. So first, Saeed, that reporter, is actually Palestinian. He's from East Jerusalem. That's his hometown. So part of what you learn when you're briefing is you get to know journalists as people. And I think that that helps. Um, I have so much empathy and sympathy for people at the podium. It is an exceedingly hard job. Uh, he is not giving his opinion, right? He's not, uh, he doesn't get to make up what he says. He is projecting the policy of Joe Biden and Tony Blinken and the United States government. And uh, I would guess that they have litigated every single word they will let him say at that podium. And there's a reason he's not saying condemn. If there's not, he should have said it. <laughs> Um, and if there is, I would urge them to revisit that. Look, I know that every time we say something, I, 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 what I imagine is happening is that they don't want to say condemn because the Israelis will get upset and they'll call like they used to when I was at the podium and they'll complain to Tony Blinken or Joe Biden or Jake Sullivan or someone, right? John Finer. Um, what I tried to do at the podium, and I don't know how successful I was, but certainly what I would do if I ever had the chance again, like that didn't pass the smell test, like just condemn it, right? Like why are, like, is that the hill we want to die on? Why can we not say the thing that we all see with our own eyes, right? And there were times I, I think the that governments do well when they either admit faults, admit they got something wrong, admit something's not going perfectly, or when they just say the thing, the truth, right? Out loud. And I just don't, I would, it would be hard pressed for me to understand why saying condemn 
would so irrevocably hurt our relationship with Israel that he was put in that position that he can't say it. It's really hard when you're in that position and they say, you can't say this, you can't say this, you can't say this. And if you have the trust of the secretary or the NS, you know, you push back and you say, come on, I have like, it's a dialogue, right? You're not just a talking point monkey. And so I would hope that he is able to, you know, say things that he would like to say that sound sort of like common sense, if that makes sense. It's a really hard job, though. You know, I was going to say, there's no way that you can convince me that's an easy job. And again, I want to encourage yeah. people to type in Rehar uh, Secret- uh, State Department, just so you can see some of the images of you. Some of it's pretty bad, right? <laughs> so there are some bad memes. Like I, I was certainly not perfect um, mm-hmm. or even close, but you have to be able. I don't know. I just it feels like it defies a little bit of logic, right? Well, and I also love that what you just said right there about learning the journalists that cover it or, and are in the room. You know, we, we've had a few that are on the show that covered the Pentagon, that covered the State Department. Mm-hmm. So the fact that you knew Saeed was Palestinian and he's been at it for a long time. He's an older gentleman for people that are watching on YouTube that saw the clip. So uh, obviously he, you know, uh, the proverbial dog in this fight, he has because of obviously his blood and heritage. So um, I, I just thought the exchange was interesting. But now. I want to pivot because there's been some more exchanges between prominent Jewish Americans out there, specifically the host of The Daily Show on Mondays. John Stewart has said some stuff. And obviously, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, who is Jewish, has also said stuff about the the aid and calling for an end to giving Israel aid until a, a temporary ceasefire is put in place. But I did want to play something for you that panned out the other day on The Daily Show with John Stewart and two journalists that have been covering this conflict. Now, again, Stewart prominent Jewish man, but has devoted uh, recently a segment on his show about this conflict overall and what is being done about it and the innocent killing that's happening of Palestinians. But listen to this exchange that happened. I want to react on the other side. Take a listen. Who is incentivized to actually fix this and isn't the people who really suffer from all of it, just the Palestinians who get no regard from any group, no real support? You know, I think that was the case for some time, but I think that things have changed in the sense that the Arab countries are very eager to get this off their plate, actually. That's why they had this Arab peace initiative and keep reiterating it, because they no longer want to have a conflict with Israel. It's not in their interest. They like to move past it, but they cannot do so in a way which ignores the Palestinians. And I think that the idea of the Abraham yeah. Accords, for instance, was let's just sidestep this issue and make deals with the Emiratis and the Saudis and so forth. I was in Saudi Arabia recently, and I was talking to a broad range of people. I think the idea that the Saudis will... You make a deal with Israel without a two-state solution or meaningful pathway to one or significant concessions on that subject. It's very unrealistic because... No, that's my the, point, yes. is, is the two-state solution. But if nobody is there to just guarantee... Everybody has preconditions for everything. You know, Netanyahu, I need a partner for... If, if you don't meet these certain conditions of no violence, I won't negotiate with you. Well, America occupied Iraq. And there was violence there the entire time. I mean, imagine if we had set a precondition that there'd be no Iraqi government unless, you know, this violence would end. It, nothing would ever. It seems like nobody's actually being honest or genuine. So, Marie, you know, a question I got asked today by my wife was, why don't the Arab countries in that region help? Like, wh- wh- like Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon. Like, why, why aren't the other countries helping? And, you know, again. I didn't work for the State Department. I didn't travel with Secretary Kerry. So I, these are tough things to answer. And I tried to explain as best as I could. But first, let's react on the soundbite. Then let maybe we'll funnel into some of your answer there. But what you make of the exchange there? They talked a little bit about the Abraham Accords. Um, it does seem like there isn't a genuineness because we talked about it before. BB does not want a two-state solution. And obviously, you know, with the PLO in the West Bank and, and what Hamas has done in Gaza, like, you don't. You, there's no path to it. We don't see one, especially after the attacks on October 7th and now with the hostages still being out there, you know, under Hamas control. So would you make of the exchange right there between Jon Stewart and that reporter from The Intercept and then explain a little bit more about the region and why the other countries are around haven't been able to help on on fixing this, you know, idea of a two state solution? Well, I think that the, the Gulf countries, I mean, I in general, the Abraham Accords, I think, were a good thing. Any country that pledges to not attack Israel or, you know, does a peace agreement, whatever we want to call them, is a good thing. But 
at the time I said they are ignoring the Palestinians and they are leaving the Palestinians out. And one of the only pieces of leverage that they have had to promote the Palestinian cause was this. So I, the fact that the Saudis, I think, are still quite willing to go ahead with this at some point is really bad for the Palestinians. There are some countries in the region who have helped them. I mean, Jordan has taken enormous numbers of refugees, of Palestinians. Whole parts of Jordan are, are basically Palestinian now. Um, there are some countries, but the Gulf states particularly have not. The Saudis, the Emiratis, the Qataris. I mean, the Qataris have tried to help a little bit, but the Qataris have also hosted much of Hamas's leadership in Doha for a long time. So I think that the Palestinians have been largely forgotten. And Prime Minister Netanyahu does not want a two-state solution, but nobody has been able to answer the questions of where these people are. So but these are humans. These are people that have very few rights, very few opportunities, very little economy to speak of. And the fact that it just doesn't seem to matter that they have they are stateless people um, living under occupation, a quite brutal one at times, um, is is heartbreaking in many ways. I'm not talking about Hamas. I'm not talking about the terrorists, but I'm talking about sort of average Palestinians. And so, you know, I think that I but we also shouldn't take agency away from them. They, there are some decisions that the Palestinians have to make about their leadership going forward. The Palestinian Authority has been corrupt, feckless, weak, um, and the Israelis made it weaker by promoting Hamas because they wanted to make the Palestinian Authority weaker. So, you know, we also need leaders among the Palestinians to emerge that will have a different um, view of what their future can look like. And hopefully that there are some leaders like that, because right now it feels like the Arab leaders or the Gulf leaders certainly are largely ignoring them, except when it suits them politically at home. It's a, I, I, it's, it is a heartbreaking situation in many, in many ways. It really is. Um, and it appears that there's no end in sight for what's happening in Ukraine with Russia and Ukraine, what's happening in Gaza as the death toll continues to rise, will continue to monitor as always uh marie i can't thank you enough for for hopping on the program with me today and filling in for nick savari i may have to do the donald trump from the apprentice in season five and say <laughs> nikki you fired and uh bring marie on full time thank you so much for for being with me marie i look i always love to and it's just one of the few places where we have a lot of time to talk about really serious issues and, and some lighter issues too so it's a big week ahead um get your coffee and your bourbon ready um and you know we'll see what it all means that's right. We'll see what it all means. If you want to watch the video portion of any of the interviews we've done on the show or see me and Marie's face, check out our YouTube channel. Type in Can We Please Talk Podcast. We should pop right up. Audio podcast platforms, you know by now, Apple, Spotify, Google. Shout out to everybody who listens to us on Good Pods. Shout out to everybody who listens to us on YouTube Music. And shout out to our ACAST, our hosting platform. We can't do it without them. We can't do it without each and every one of you that listens into this program. As always, I am Mike Leon. We'll see everybody next time. <laughs>